um, yeah. So I'm just going to talk really, really briefly about the global context of seed. This is a massive topic, which I'm sure that a lot of you already know quite a lot about, to be fair. Um, and so I'm going to literally just cover it in like two minutes. <laughs> so there's obviously going to be loads more to find out. We won't cover everything. This is my tour. Um, Anyway, what I'm going to say is, so uh, this is a fact that probably a lot of you already know, um, but in the last 100 years, we've lost 75% of our crop diversity. So that is quite a shocking fact, and that kind of underpins a lot of the work that we're doing with the Seed Sovereignty Programme to try to increase crop diversity, because a loss of 75% is an incredible amount of loss. Um, illustrates that this diagram and this is uh, American seed companies specifically so um, this is the top part of this kind of tree is in 1903 and this is like analyzing uh, commercial seed houses and some of the varieties that they offer so you can see for example with the peas there's um, 408 different varieties in 1903 and then they were analyzed 80 years later in 1983 and you can see like how all of the diversity of varieties that are offered have completely shrunk so that just again illustrates like the rate with which we've been losing crop diversity over the last hundred years um what was it like before that hundred years um before this sudden like loss of crop diversity um well yeah the answer is that we had a kind of mosaic of regionally specific varieties um, and um, so like not only would different crops be grown all around the world, obviously, where um, the climate like, you know, different crops would be grown to suit the climates of different countries. But within those countries, there would have been like a mosaic of regionally specific varieties. And so like each community would have their kind of own varieties of the crops that they would select year on year. And so they'd be quite different from place to place. And obviously that would result in like a diversity of crops, but it would also result in like um, a whole diversity of regional flavors and dishes and kind of cultural stories around these seeds. So basically the answer is that seed you know varieties used to be incredibly diverse um and seed saving was always really central to farming and i guess that's a weird thing to say like but in the uk now like a lot of us um myself included order our seeds in from elsewhere but obviously um for hundreds and thousands of years like seed saving has been like a central part to farming because obviously you can't grow crops without saving seeds and people would have done that on farm and then um, obviously, like um, there's been natural breeding of of the foods that we eat, the crops that we grow for hundreds and thousands of years, like um, most of the food crops, they're not wild plants, they're um, varieties that have been selected by communities over hundreds and thousands of years. So we've always bred, um, bred our food crops. And uh, oh. <laughs> so this just kind of illustrates that um, natural breeding and selection that's happened over hundreds and thousands of years. So you've got here like a brassica oleracea and you've got the kind of wild brassica at the top. And it's just like a visual representation of how um, that brassica oleracea has been selected for different things. So like where people have selected generation over generation for stems for example then that's where we've got the kohlrabi from or where people have selected the leaves that's where we've got kale or broccoli where it's been selected for the stems and flowers but basically all of those um, different varieties of brassica are actually all the same species so they've just been yeah selected from that one wild brassica oleracea so it, that's just kind of a visualization of that and don't worry later in the course we're going to go into great depth on selection this is just kind of introducing the idea to you um, so next slide. Oh, sorry, Katie. Sorry, Mine's I've broken up. Uh, can you do the next one? Thanks. Yeah, so I just, just wanted to mention um, the presence of gene banks and seed banks around the world. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of like the Svarbald um, in Norway, the seed bank, that's the one in the kind of top left. 
and it's like um, seeds from all around the world have been locked in this seed bank, you know, to preserve them for the future. And obviously that is a good thing that um, some of the seed diversity is kind of locked away in vaults um, and preserved from total extinction. Um, but it's also not an ideal situation because um, seeds are stored in gene banks in really tiny quantities and they're kind of locked away in these vaults um, and they're not necessarily being grown out every year and they're not being shared with people and they're not adapting to a changing climate or to people's different regional conditions. So although it's great that there are kind of vaults of um, seed diversity that we can kind of go to to look at some of the diversity from the past, maybe revive some of it, it's also not an ideal situation like ideally we'd have this diversity out in the fields and in our communities um, but we do know that gene banks and seed banks have 7.4 million collections of seeds locked away across the world some are owned by governments some are private some are owned by plant breeders um, but there is a way to kind of access some of the genetic diversity from the past that we may have almost lost um, when it's locked away in these in these gene banks uh, next slide please so where have all the seeds gone is like the million dollar question. And um, yeah, there's a, a very brief overview, but basically with the industrialization of farming, obviously um, seed has also been industrialized at the same time over the last hundred years. So they've kind of worked hand in hand, this industrialization of farming and the industrialization of seed. Um, and so now a lot of seed uh, is bred by large companies, not by communities. And so often when seed is bred by uh, large companies for sale to make profit, um, it's, it's bred with kind of the needs of large scale and kind of industrialized farming in mind. So like one example is with um, peas that might be bred to be kind of short and uniform so they can all be harvested easily by machines, but that might not be what different communities or market gardeners need. They might need tall peas or they might need peas that grow in different ways or, you know, they might want genetically diverse peas, but um, a lot of the seed breeding is now driven by what's suited to large scale agriculture and industrialized farming. Um, and then there's an issue with seeds um, because seeds are now being increasingly bred and sold um, for profit. Then it's um, we've got centralized seed production. So like one example is in the UK, like we import a lot of seed from Spain. Actually, if you go to some of the big seed companies, like a lot of your seed that you're ordering will have been grown in Spain. And because that's where they can get high yields and it's efficient for them to grow it all in one place and then kind of ship it out across the EU. Um, but that means that that seed is not adapted to our conditions. So it's, you know, it's grown for a Spanish climate, not for a Welsh climate. Um, so, yeah, we don't have locally adapted seed. And then there's um, issues with F1s and GMO seeds. I'm not really going to talk about that now. We'll talk about that later. Um, so, yeah, just moving on from that. But basically, seed loss is completely inseparable from kind of what's happening globally with um corporations and a globalized food system so those are kind of contributing factors to this like loss of diversity um next slide please and you won't be able to read all this but that's fine it's just a visual representation again of like the concentration of power in the seed industry globally so all of these small circles are seed companies and uh, this person, um, Phil Howard, has analysed the lines al illustrate um, which companies own these seed companies. So you can see that there's a very few companies here that own like an incredible amount of the global seed companies. And the ones that are in red, these four in the middle, these big circles, they're actually chemical corporations and they own a lot of the smaller seed companies so that's just a visualization of kind of where the power lies with the commercial seed at the moment um next slide and that's a fact from from that from that diagram which is that four corporations control an estimated 60 percent of global seed sales so that just kind of again tells you um where the power is with seed selling um next slide but it's not all bad news <laughs> because I know that I can feel like pretty a horrible state of affairs. But the um, the good thing is that like um, so seeds obviously hold a lot of power, like beyond 
um, commercial value. So, and I know it's a really blindingly obvious statement, but I sometimes have to remind myself that like seed is the start of all of our food. It's an incredibly powerful thing. If we don't have diverse seed, we can't have diverse food. But of course, that's a positive thing because um, this phrase like agriculture, not agribusiness, it's agriculture, you know, diversities of seed and diversities of food crops that come from that seed. Um, it's all about human culture and seed is like revered in many cultures in rituals and kind of um yeah ceremonies and kind of people have this uh, real respect for seed far beyond it as something that just can be traded and sold um next slide and so yeah there is a seed sovereignty movement around the globe which um you know we'll talk about throughout the course um but people who are um, working to kind of build a more resilient seed system that's outside of this kind of corporate ownership or outside of um, these like industrialized seed systems. So one example here is Navdanya, which is in northern India, and that's Dr. Vandana Shiva at the bottom, and she's kind of leading this movement um, of farmers in India, a lot of them women, to kind of be growing their own farmer varieties and sharing them amongst each other and building an alternative seed movement um, where there isn't corporate control of their seed system. Uh, next slide. And another example of this, an amazing person is Rowan White. So she's from the Alliance of Native Seed Keepers in North America. And uh, she makes the point that, um, you know, while with seed loss, there's also cultural loss because seed is culturally very important and holds a lot of our stories and a lot of our foods and like rituals and, you know, our culture is tied up in our seed. So when you lose uh, seed diversity, you lose cultural diversity. But the flip side of that, the positive side of that is um, when you re revitalize seed, you also revitalize culture. So the Alliance of Native Seed Keepers are doing a lot of work to um, revitalize their native seeds and this is just um, a nice quote from her where she says um, it turns out that not only do seeds have this incredible diversity a prism of different colors and shapes and sizes and places where they grow best mm -hmm. and communities that they come from but they also carry stories and beautiful lineages of relationships so she's just kind of mentioning yeah the power of these seeds um, next slide and this is Rowan White again, and she's just talking about um, when her community and communities around the world kind of take back their seeds and kind of take back control of their seed systems. Um, it is also for them an act of decolonialization. So she's saying, um, to me, decolonialization is the foundation of the seed sovereignty movement. I also like to put a positive spin on it. It's re indigenizing we are claiming back our traditions and rehydrating those original agreements that we had with the plants, with our ancestors, and also with our descendants. So again, like the positivity of reclaiming the power and kind of producing seed. And then next slide. This is my final slide and I just wanted to bring it back to Wales because I just wanted to say that um, this kind of idea of re-indigenizing seed is not just something that's happening um, in other countries, it's something that's happening here too. So yeah, with the Seed Sovereignty Programme, we work with a network of grain growers um, and some of them in this picture here, older farmers who are trying to stop their kind of native indigenous oat seeds from going extinct. And for them, that's like a cultural statement as well as um, a good thing to do in terms of producing seed. So that's it for my bit. Um, thanks for sharing those, Sarah. We can stop the screen share. That's like a massive flyby tour of issues. <laughs> and there's loads more info out there that I can send to you, but it, that's just like kind of saying, these are things that you could kind of look further into if you wanted. And the idea of this is just to set the context of like our seed production, like what is globally happening. Uh, and back and we're going to now hear from um, Sue Stickland about the history and politics of seed in the UK specifically. Um, so like to bring some of that global context back to a more local context. Um, so yeah, Sue. Okay, yeah. Well, I, I find this bit of history actually fascinating, but more to the point, I think it, it should help you understand 
uh, the seed trade and the present situation and, and hopefully what needs to change and what we might be able to help change. Um, as Katie said, most gardeners and growers these days nearly always buy seeds from catalogues or websites and they rarely think about where the seeds came from or where they were produced. Um, and there also appears on the face of it to be plenty of choice. Uh, so there weren't always catalogues or websites selling seeds. Uh, if we go back to the 15th and 16th century, then here farmers and gardeners were the seed producers. Uh, as Katie said, the two, role, the two roles were, were just inextricably linked. Um, some people might buy seeds at fairs and markets or perhaps in grocers or general stores in major towns, but these would have been produced by other farmers and gardeners and, and many of the early gardening books uh, gave instructions about how to save seeds and this is one of the most popular, you might have come across it, Thomas Tusser's books. and you can see that he not only uh, says that, we, that everybody should save their own seeds, but he's also advocating that we swap them as well. So seed swaps are, are nothing new. But if we move on to the 17th and 18th century, then this is when you start to get um, the specialist seedsmen set up. One of the earliest surviving catalogues is this one from someone called w William Lucas, and it was based in London. And uh, the, it would seem very basic today. For example, you had either you could either get round turnips or long turnips, uh, but you also started to get local strains of crops, and these were developed by market gardeners. Uh, there was a, a sandwich sandwich radish, I think, and a sandwich bean, named after the Kent town, uh, which was a big market gardening area, and these would have been developed just by observing which. This, uh, which plants did best in the local area, saving seeds from these. So, but these catalogues were, were really for wealthy customers in the, in, the, in the major towns. In the countryside, so the smallholders, gardeners, farmers, they would still mostly be saving their own seeds. If you move on to Victorian times, then uh, the Industrial Revolution, the vast growth in towns and cities meant you had many more market gardens to supply the people and there was a corresponding increase in seed companies and each of the seed companies had their own catalogues and varieties. Uh, these are mostly bred just by selecting plants that did the best. There might have been kind of accidental chance crosses but they didn't have any knowledge of genetics and um, quite a few of them were, were selected by market gardeners, but also, you know, the large Victorian estates with the wonderful, with, with the wonderful uh, walled gardens. The, the head gardeners there had lots of experience and, and many varieties were selected and bred by them. Uh, these are two that survive today. It's uh, the Blenheim Orange Melon, which was, which was, um, came from the Duke of Marlborough's estate in Oxfordshire and the Rousham Park Hero Onion, which was also from, from an Oxfordshire estate. So they still in cultivation today. So you can see that um, you've got lots of small seed companies spread around the country and they were all had their own seed list. list. So they had hundreds of different varieties. And you can see uh, here that far from just having a round turnip and a long turnip. Now Sutton's in uh, 1895, have got 19 different varieties of turnip. So plenty of biodiversity. Uh, there's also, I noticed, Chirk Castle black stone turnip. So a Welsh one. There. Uh, they weren't necessarily all different. It, it was a lot of seed companies actually just took varieties from other seed, seed companies and renamed them. And they often put the name, name of the seed company in front of them, which you can see has definitely happened here. 
Um, but also, even worse, the seed quality wasn't that great either. Um, unscrupulous companies bulked out good seed with, with old seed or dead seed or even sand or grit. And, and as you know, it's, it's often um, impossible to tell uh, whether a seed will germinate just, just from looking at it. So uh, in the early 1900s, you've got the first regulation of seed quality. Uh, the, after the First World War, the, um, there was a quest really for a, a more efficient agriculture and uh, this addressed seed quality. It laid out the minimum germination standards for seed and that's an aspect of, 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 seed, of the seed trade which is still important today. But at the same time, we get more, more um, scientific plant breeding. The, the laws of genetics had become recognised and uh, new varieties were then made by making deliberate crosses between likely parents. But then the seeds were grown out, the best progeny selected, but usually for several gener generations until you've got a stable variety. And these were all open pollinated varieties, all, all genetically diverse, but quite a few old garden favorites go back to that time. So this is uh, at the top there is Elster Craig tomato, and this is the, the broad bean epicure, which is very notable for its, for its pink skin. So some seed was produced in the UK, mainly in Essex, which became rather a specialist seed growing area. But increasingly seed was produced abroad, often in southern France and Europe. But you still had um, many different seed companies in different parts of the UK, and they were all selecting and breeding their own varieties so that the varieties were actually adapted and they did have plenty of diversity. It was just the seed that was produced um, in, in, the better, in the better climate of, of southern France and, and, and Spain. At the Second World War I saved all that. Um, it was uh, stopped all that. It was almost a, a matter of, you know, save seed for victory as well as dig for victory. Seed couldn't be imported and there was quite a lot of government support for seed saving. And this is a, a leaflet at the time which shows how parts of Eastern England were divided up into zones and you were only allowed to grow certain crops for seed in, 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 diff in the different zones so that, that there was no cross-pollination and the seed quality was improved. And gardeners were uh, encouraged to save their own seed too. This is one of the Dig for, Dig for Victory leaflets, the famous Dig for Victory leaflets on saving your own seed. And then you can see um, this is the trial, this is the grounds of Sutton Seeds, which was based in Reading then. And this is a crop of broccoli being grown for seed. And that's something you, you certainly wouldn't see in Sutton Seeds today. But then it was after the, the Second World War that things began to set, change. Uh, as Katie said, uh, in, in agriculture became industrialized, uh, chemical inputs were the norm. Instead of market gardens, you've got fields growing lots of just one crop. And more important, the, there was a change in the food system too. The, instead of the green grocers, you had supermarkets and they just wanted large amounts of a single crop all at once, whether it was tomatoes or cabbages or cucumber. Each had to be the same and they had to be the right size and shape for packaging. They had to be able to travel. They had to last on the shelf. And so these are the sort of qualities that plant breeders concentrated on when they were breeding new vegetable varieties. Um, and they increasingly did this by creating F1 hybrids where two inbred parent lines of plants across every time the seeds need to be produced. We will, nearly all the seed will be produced abroad um, I, I mean, China, it's, China's one of the major seed producers. And if it's something like carrots, which is field grown, um, then New Zealand it, 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 uh, and Eastern Europe, some in Italy. 
So our, our, our seed crops are, are being produced a long way from home, but more important, it's more important that the breeding isn't done for our climate. So when, when all this was taking uh, place, the, seed, the small seed companies just couldn't com compete. They couldn't afford the specialist seedsmen. They couldn't afford the facilities that modern plant breeding needed. And it wasn't worth going on breeding varieties for gardeners and small scale growers because there was no money in it. So more and more were closed down or taken over by the large companies. And it then ended up with the diagram that, that Katie, Katie showed with, with four of the major chemical companies controlling most of the seeds. But as, the, as the small seed companies uh, closed or were taken over, all the unique varieties from their seed lists were dropped and all the genetic diversity they contained was gradually lost. Then another threat came in the 1960s and 70s when the UK prepared to, to, to join the, um, the EU. Uh, they, there was a Plant Varieties and Seeds Act passed which said that all varieties offered for sale must be registered on a UK national list or later when we join the EU on the EU common catalogue and one way or another this caused lots of varieties to be lost. Either seed companies just didn't bother to register them in time and if they weren't registered initially then it cost a lot of money for them uh, to, add, to add them and it wasn't worth it when it was just small um, which when it was just varieties that were only sold to gardeners in small quantities. And sometimes they were said to be synonyms of others. Uh, this is a, a famous example of that. The uh, onion up to date was said to be a synonym of the, the more well-known onion Bedfordshire champion. But in fact, the Ministry of Agriculture's own trials showed that up to date was more disease resistant than Bedfordshire champion. And um, so, so uh, the, the, the choice of synonym of which varieties to drop was really very cursory, just made on external appearance often. If you wanted to add a variety to the national list, then it had to undergo what, what's called a DUS test, and all this still exists today. DUS stands for distinct. The variety has to be shown to be distinct from other varieties. All the plants have to be uniform, that's the U, and the, the variety has to be stable from one generation to the next. So all this testing is not only expensive, but some of the old and local varieties are actually too variable in order to pass this test. So what next? So for the last 50 years, uh, we've been running on the uh, European Union seed laws. Um, it's very too complex to go into, but there has been some relaxation of the, of the original legislation to allow for biodiversity. For example, there's been creation of a category called an amateur variety, and this is um, the bean Q blue, which actually the Welsh have just registered or in the process of registering as an amateur variety. And it's not so expensive or so restrictive to register these varieties on the, on the national list. Uh, but there's also been an increase in, in bureaucracy, such as plant passports and other and, and, and uh, phytosanitary certificates. So uh, at the moment, all the European law is being carried over into the UK. Uh, but um, now is the time that it might be possible to change it to make it better for gardeners and small scale, small, small scale commercial enterprises and any varieties just sold in small quantities. So uh, a group of, 
of uh, independent seed companies, small independent seed companies are all getting together, facilitated by Gaia to, to lobby DEFRA to, to look at the how the legislation might work and to begin to lo 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 uh, lobby DEFRA. So I think that's... Um, Amazing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> do you want to um, do we want to look about in more detail about F1 hybrids and uh, Katie then? Yeah, I do think it would be useful now to just give people an overview because we have talked about F1 and not everybody might not know what that and means. So, okay. Yeah. Sue, do you want to just take us through that and and then we'll move on to hearing from Anne? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I don't know what I've done there. I'm trying. Um... So I know we're giving you guys a lot of history and background, and hopefully it's not too overwhelming. But we're just trying to set the context for stuff that we'll be covering in the future sessions. But we will come back to all of this again. So don't worry if um, some of it is passing you by. I think that I think that's very true of, of uh, Katie, um, because I think that that once you've done the course and you you know more about selection and um, sorry, I'm just trying to find the rest of this. We can see your slide. We can see the slide. Page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you do sometimes break up a little bit. So it might help to turn your camera off. I mean, we okay. could still follow like, what you were saying, but um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, um... Great. So we can see. I can't that. get into my camera now. <laughs> well, don't worry. Just carry on then. I'll tell okay. you if it gets bad. Yeah. Okay. Just shout. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's best not to think about this too hard. Um, because by the time, by the end of the course, and 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 by the time you've kind of learned about inbreeding and outbreeding crops, and about plant selection and and plant populations, it will all begin to fall into place. And I th I don't think it helps that both the terms open pollinated and and F1 hybrid are used in a, in a more general sense because uh, open pollinated is is just often used as the way and the natural way in which plants pollinate in the wild so pollen is exchanged freely between them um, but that can actually start to be confusing when you think of vegetable varieties. I think in, in this context that the key points to hang on to is that the open pollinated varieties uh, what we call breed true that is the seed from them uh, gives plants that have broadly the same characteristics of the parents and, and those they will pass those characteristics on so you can save seed from them. However, they, they still do have some variability and they still carry a wide, wide genetic diversity so they can adapt to different growing conditions or disease pressures and that's very important so you can, you can select local varieties and particularly in view of climate change, it, it, that's going to be very important indeed. So most open pollinated varieties, I think I touched on this in the history, they'll be bred from either just by selection, um, which is the original way of doing it, or they may be then bred by crossing two chosen parent plants, but th th these will both be fairly genetically diverse. And then the variety with the, the desired characteristics will be selected out over a number of generations and sometimes uh, up to 10 generations breeding a new open pollinated variety isn't isn't a, a isn't a quick thing and until it's then stable that is then you can save seed from it and you get uh, you get um, plants with the same characteristics. I think you've got to appreciate that 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 every time um, you actually breed a crop to eat, then you are reducing the genetic diversity in some way. And that's why it's so important to have 
lots of people doing it in lots of different places and and that when they all have different ways they want to use the crop then 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 that's how you maintain the diversity so um everyone hybrid varieties in term is, is just used in genetic for the for, for the first generation after a cross but in vegetable variety terms that um vegetable hybrid f1 hybrid seed is is produced by crossing two inbred lines and um uh so that means that you choose two parent parent lines and you you inbreed them that is you self-pollinate them until you get two very pure distinct and uniform plant lines and, and those will have a very narrow range of characteristics and of course we've seen what characteristics those are um, the sorts that the supermarket wants and then these individual lines across to produce seed so this this seed gives very uniform plants because of the nature of its its parentage <clears throat> And this is, of course, it's of value to commercial growers, but not necessarily to gar gardeners, because one of the things they want is that the F1 hybrids um, all can all be harvested at once. But that's not not at all what you want if you're if you're a gardener or if you're gr growing for a box scheme. You want to be able to you want a long harvest period. Even even having them all the same size is not necessarily desirable. And if you will try to save seed from these plants, they will they won't be true to what we call true to type. That is, they won't look like the parent plants. They might be sterile, or they they won't they'll produce plants that are a whole mix of shapes and sizes and types. And most of them will often be of poor quality. So you can't rely on saving seed from an F1 hybrid. And so every time a company wants to produce a, F, a seed of an F1 hybrid, they have to cross these two parent lines. So that actually um, that actually is uh, good for them in that no other company should, will know what the parent lines are. So nobody can take their, their variety and reproduce it. But of course, it, it costs quite a lot to maintain the parent lines. So that's one of the reasons why F1 hybrid seed is so expensive. Uh, I'll leave it there then, Katie, because I think there are probably more will come out in questions about that. Absolutely, thank you. And if you've never produced seed before and this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. <laughs> if you've never produced seed before, you might be quite confused about some of the things, yeah, in the definitions of OP and F1. We will come back to it again and again. So we just wanted to explain it now up front and then we'll we'll return to the difference between F1 seeds and OP seeds. Um, but thanks, Sue. That was really good clarification. Cool. All right. So um, I don't know if we. Yeah, if we do. Is there any pressing questions for Sue on what she's just said? Because um, maybe we should do those now before Anne speaks. Um, you can either raise your hand on camera or you could type it in the chat if you have a question for Sue. Um, I'm just looking around if anyone has their hand up. Uh, okay. No pressing questions. Yeah, someone's flagging up there. Um, Sue's written a book, Back Garden Seed Saving. I'll send you all a link to that. It's a really helpful book which explains a lot about seed saving. Um, cool. Okay, no pressing questions. All right, so I'm gonna um, say hi to Anne, Anne Owen. Um, hopefully you can turn your camera on, Anne, and unmute yourself. Hey. Um, so this is Anne Owen from Einion's Garden. And uh, yeah, she's based in Machantlet near me. So we've been working together for a few years on various different community growing projects and stuff. Um, but Anne is a professional market gardener and she's also a seed producer. So uh, the reason I asked her to come to this call was because I wanted her to tell you a little bit like about what it's like to actually produce seed as a market gardener. Um, 
so that we're not just talking about all this theoretical global context stuff, but you actually hear from a seed producer what it's like to actually produce seed. So yeah, Anne, um, do you want to tell us a bit about what you do? Um, yeah, hi. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, I run a small market garden together with my husband. It's actually a tiny market garden. It's on two thirds of an acre and some of that is compost bins. So it is really small. And I would have never thought that on our small spot, there would have been enough space to do grow crops for seed saving. But I've been amazed actually how easy it was to fit it all into our, our production. And, uh, and it's, been, it's been actually really good fun and it's been a good earner. So it all started when I started getting seeds from the Real Seed Company and they always encourage you to save your own seeds. And uh, I didn't bother for the first few years. And then I remember one time I let some parsley go to seed and it self-seeded. And the next year I had loads of parsley plants that just put themselves there, you know, just volunteers. And I, I dug them up and planted them where I want them. And that was sort of the first time that I had a crop from seeds produced by my own plants. And that got me thinking that was quite easy. So, um, I then started experimenting with other things, collecting seeds, initially mostly flowers, uh, but then later on also tomatoes. And then I uh, took some of the courses that Katie was running with, uh, Ga with Gaia Foundation and we went to visit Real Seeds and we got the training and it, wasn't, it was really quite simple. The next thing I knew, I was growing a crop for the Real Seed Company to save seed. and it, Initially, it was quite nerve wracking because it's made out to be such a specialized industry, saving seed. It's made out to be something that they do there and you grow your crops here. And, uh, and I was amazed actually how easy it was. So I grew tomatoes. I think it was the Amish paste tomato. And I grow a big tomato every year, a kind of paste tomato just for our own use a little bit to sell but also for our own use because I, I like to fill my freezer with passata you know and so this tomato I grew the, the requirement was to grow 12 plants I grew 18 just to be on the safe side uh, and I just made sure that they were really really ripe when I picked them and then I processed them which was also quite a fascinating uh, process and I ended up with seed and I still ended up with a freezer full of passata. So I only gained really from what normally I would have thrown away, you know, in the, in the compost. And then I send my seeds off and they then Kate at uh, the real seed company tested them. And it turned out they had a really good germination ratio. And I was amazed. I was actually amazed that it worked and at how simple it was and how trouble free. And it meant because it worked that year that I, from then on, I just saved seed from all the tomatoes that were in their ones. And I found my own saved seed from Gardener's Delight tomato was so much, it gave so much better plants. The plants were more vigorous. They, they didn't seem to struggle so much. I didn't have, normally because we grow quite a few, so I would probably grow about 24, uh, delight, sorry, on the delights plants. And what I found was I didn't have any weaklings amongst that, you know, because usually you, you, you grow your tomato plants and on that kind of quantity, you'll find that you have about two or three that don't perform as well as the others, you know, because they're all old heritage varieties. They're not the F1, so they're not uniform. And yet with the ones that I'd grown from my own seed, None of them was weak. They were all good and vigorous and took off. And so this, then the next year I grew another tomato for the Real Seed Company, which was a bit more of a roller coaster because our plot is very damp, very wet, uh, quite shaded at times. Um, we're actually in the corner of a bog. And even though we had a really warm spring, we then got a very um, cold spell just before the summer. And uh, the tomato I was growing, which was uh, called Feo de Rio Gordo, really didn't like that cold spell. And I, I ended up with a lot of um, 
uh, mold on them. But we just stripped the moldy leaves off, gave them a good trim, a good prune. And then once the summer kicked in, they took off again. And even that crop worked, even though I thought this is never going to work because they really weren't happy. And I still got a fantastic crop of tomatoes from them, really tasty tomatoes and a really good seed crop. Same year, I was also growing cucumbers. I was growing the mini white cucumbers. Um, and normally I grow several varieties of cucumbers for the market, for the box scheme. But this year uh, we decided, well, you can't grow on such a small plot. You can't grow two lots of cucumbers if you're saving seed of one because they will just cross. So we just grew more of the little white cucumbers, more plants. And that were the only ones that we grew that year for market, but actually they were really popular. And I've got a really good seed crop from those. And they were amazing. I mean, if there's a crop that's really easy and really profitable to grow seed for it, it it's cucumbers. Because uh, again, the process of, uh, of getting the seeds out is actually quite good fun. So the way, it's similar to with tomatoes and uh, cucumbers. So you, you scrape the seeds out of the really ripe fruit and then you ferment it. So it goes in with a bit of the pulp and some water into a jar and then you just leave it sit for two, three days, depending on how the fermenting goes. And then you start washing it and it's, it's called water winnowing. So you add water, you screw the lid on the, on the jar, you give them a good shake and then you pour off the dirty water and all bad seeds, everything that floats, you all pour that off and you end up just with a really nice clean seed crop. So, I enjoy that process and I also enjoy the process with the tomato seed, which is similar. Uh, and for drying them, you, you just need to make sure that you, you spread them out on something um, quite, uh, how shall I say, non-sticky, something quite shiny. You can, you can use a plate. Uh, I used uh, sheets of my um, dehydrator. And uh, once they dry, once tomato seeds dry, they're amazing. They're really worth looking on under a little a little enlarge um, what you call that you know one of those uh, um, jewelers loops it's really interesting to see how every seed is absolutely coated in golden hairs they look a bit like the the seeds kind of teddy bear of the lot really so they're, they're really good fun last year i also saved lots of seed of uh, more rare french bean varieties and uh, that's, I find that really interesting because everybody's looking at eating more local and having more of a vegetable protein, yet very few people are growing French beans for drying beans. So everybody's growing them to eat them as green beans, as snap beans. And, and really they are such an amazing winter crop. You know, you can, you harvest them at the end of the summer and you have them all winter long because you dry them and you have them all winter long. And they're really amazing. They're not, they're not the same as the dried beans that you buy in a whole food shop. They are much nicer in taste. And, uh, and also, you know, it's probably the most ecologically sound protein that you could eat, you know, because you grow it yourself. It doesn't have to travel. Um, and again, so easy to save the seed of. So you save, I don't know, 20, 50 seeds and the rest you can eat. So there's really no no loss there. It's it's you set about three or four plants aside that you save seed off and and the rest you eat. So that's again that's quite an easy one to do. I must admit I've been not very successful with pumpkins um, and courgettes, and I think in part that is because we have such a sunless and wet patch. So that's probably something for people who have a better patch with a little bit more airflow and uh, a bit more sun uh, to do crops like pumpkins, which have such a long season. I mean, it's, it's three months without wanting to save seed. It's probably, you can add another month to it. You know, if you really want to ripen them fully for seed, you need even a bit longer than that. So, so yeah, that's the, the kind of seeds that I, I grew. Last year for me, uh, from real seeds, I earned a thousand pounds just from my seed crops. So that was for the cucumbers and for the tomatoes. 
and and that's a big part of my income you know the small market garden doesn't make much money so it was really profitable and really worthwhile okay so if you have any questions just throw them at me thanks Anne. that's um really good overview and yeah before we open it up to questions um i mean think start typing them in the chat if you have them um yeah, just on that financial um, viability thing. I mean, that's when we've run these seed production trainings in the past, we've always said like, there's obviously huge benefits to you for saving your own seed on farm because of local adaption and quality, which you totally just said, Anne. And then also there is this added income stream element. And I think you're a really good example of that because you're saving your own seed, but you're also selling some seed crops. Um, and I did want to say to people that we do work closely with real seeds and some other ecological seed um, businesses and they are keen to take on more Welsh growers and you know um, learning to produce good quality seed it does take you quite a few years so they're only keen to take on people who've produced a high quality crop for a, few, a couple of years already but once you have like got that under your belt and you know how to produce a high quality crop there is huge opportunity to be contracted to grow these crops for seed companies so yeah, and it's interesting to know, Anne, were you saying two varieties um, and you earn a thousand pounds from selling them a seed? Yeah. So would you say that that is significantly more profitable than selling those same plants as crops? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. 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 And especially because with the tomatoes, it's, it's a double whammy. I still get all the fruit pulp which I freeze and eat and I get the seeds as well. So, you know, it's a, it's a total winner. Cucumbers less so because obviously you, there's nothing you can do with the cucumber flesh. Uh, I, I tried a little bit, I, I, I thought a little bit about um, maybe seeing if I could bring the cucumbers to a local zoo, you know, to so that they could feed them to the animals. But then of course, Corona happened and that all went out of the window. But that is something to look at because I don't like to have lots of edible waste. So it doesn't get totally wasted because it goes on a compost heap. But all the same, it would be nice to know that the, the, the pulp, the fruit pulp would still be edible for something. And I think it can be used for animal feed. So if you've got more of a mixed farm where you've got animals, then you can still feed that to your animals. Uh, and we also knew of a seed, well, we know of a seed producer, Daniel, who, because um, it's a good point that someone's just made in the chat as well about selling the flesh of the seed crops. He knew a cafe that would take the squash flesh once he'd cut it up. So, you know, he was taking the squash seed that he'd saved yeah. and then also selling the flesh to a cafe for processing. Yeah. But there are some seed crops that you can't do that with like brassicas and, and lettuce and stuff like that because obviously when you grow them for seed then they're no good as a crop anymore but there are some that can be like yeah that really cool double whammy um there's a question here about um have you tried um salad uh crop for seeds presumably lettuce um i have tried lettuce but the problem again i i'm going to try it again this year uh, the problem was I didn't specifically start thinking about it before I planted the plants or before I decided to let them go to seed. Uh, and, and that's the, the difference. When you are really intending to save seed from something, you have to give a little bit of thought of to when you're planting it, when it's going to flower and how long it will take for these to mature and dry. So I did try lettuce and I left it too late in the season. And so by the time the flowers were there and the seed was setting and it was drying, botrytis set in. And that is again, because our plot is very, very damp. Uh, so not ideal. You, you probably want to try and do it earlier in the season. If, if well, I would now try and, and uh, do it earlier in the season with my lettuces because of, of the fact that it's so damp and there's not a lot of airflow on my plot. Uh, Casey, I, the, I think, um... Jeff, Jeff has uh, grown a crop of lettuce for real seeds. Mm. Yeah, yeah, great. And also, I just uh, there's a comment in the chat um, about um, lettuce bolting and people saving seed from it. And I thought we should say that now at the beginning of this course, it's actually that's quite a bad idea because if your lettuce bolts and then you save seed from that, 
you're actually basically selecting it for the trait of bolting. So like the traits will go through in the seeds. So what you want to do is save from the highest quality crops. And you also want to make sure that they haven't crossed with other varieties. So it's quite a common thing is like um, people do with chard as well, you know, is the chard bolts and they think, oh, maybe I can use this seed. But firstly, the chard will have crossed with potentially other varieties um, and like maybe with beetroot and other things. So you won't actually get what you think you're going to get. And also then you're saving for the trait of bolting again. So, you know, if you keep saving bolted seed, your crops are going to be more and more likely to bolt. But we'll cover that a lot more in selection and like isolation and stuff like that. Um, Jeff, did you want to say something about growing lettuce or the seed? Um, yeah, um, well, we were we were contracted to do one crop of red iceberg lettuce because real seeds were buying it in from Oregon couldn't find a, a, a couldn't find any source in the UK so um, it was a bit of a challenge I love a challenge so we went for that um, it's all about space allocation you don't have to have a lot of plants but you've got to start with quite a lot because um, you go through a process of selection quite quickly roguing we, we, we call it where so you don't plant too close together as you would for a lettuce that you're going to cut early and eat or you're going to get out of the ground quickly and put it into your boxes you want it to sit there you know for a good mm, seven eight months if you can squeeze that out of it so the thing is is start early um have some tunnel space if you're doing it outside lettuce is a killer you know the weather will will, will kill you every time so um a little tunnel space you could even do it in a large greenhouse you know so it has to be controlled start early get them growing with a good root system plenty of air circulation um red iceberg was a real challenge because it's a heart in lettuce which are far more complicated uh, it's a lot easier to do something that's open leaf uh, but we were contracted to do the Red Iceberg, so I went for it. Bit of a challenge. Uh, I was lucky to have Sue mentoring me on that. So, you know, when I was having some real problems, you go in in the morning and like five of them have rotted, completely just gone. They looked great the day before. That was a real shock. But I started off with enough plants. So, but, you know, I tried to figure that out. You don't overwater. You don't just put water on there, you know, you, you go every day and you make sure every plant gets the same water. It's quite easy. You just hold a hose low to the ground. You don't spray on top of it with a head in lettuce because it'll hold the moisture in there. And that's what creates the rot. So it was a question of straight down to the ground, water them right on the soil surface. You can see, ooh, it's sucking it right up. Nice if you've got good ground, obviously. Um, but you're controlling it, so you have to be there. The weather is not going to help you at all. What it does do, it takes away the possibility of storms or, or the plant getting rocked around wow. and its root system coming out of the ground and so on and so forth. So staking. You don't stake every plant, but you make sure that your little area is going to be able to hold itself up, a, little, a few stakes and a little bit of string around the outside so they don't topple over. Because when they do go to seed, all of a sudden, the whole center of gravity shifts. This plant comes up, you know, it's four foot high uh, and more. And if you haven't got it held in there, it'll fall over, it'll pull itself out of the ground, seeds on the floor, you know, and you've got lots of little seedlings on the floor, but you have got nothing to sell. So it, you just got to be in there, make sure that you're nurturing this thing, uh, nurturing these plants, loving them and sort of saying, you know what? That one over there doesn't look good. It's a goner. You know, I'm going to have something in my sandwich today. It's out. Any any disease, anything like that, well, it's gone straight away. It's not like, oh, but it's my little seedling. It's out. You know, so you wind up with, I went from like 45, 50 plants, got a bit worrying, you know, down to about 25. Uh, as has already been said, you only have to have like 12 to 15 plants to get a viable seed crop. So figure that out, you know, you know, but if you're growing commercially, if you're going to grow into sell, um, you know, you want as many plants as you can. And as long as they're all healthy and, and good looking and you've got room in the tunnel to do that. 
The problem with Kaitan is that we grow vegetables. You know, we feed 120 families every week. So we've got, that's what we're all about. So I've got to go to the chief grower, go to the assistant grower and say, how much space can you give me, um, you know, to grow these seed crops? And that's, I've got to, I've got to justify that for the whole season. Otherwise, yeah. our, our, you know, our members are going to suffer, right? Because they're not getting uh, as much food as they could have done because we're a membership. We don't sell veg, we distribute everything that we grow to our membership. Well, it's so, a good point, Jeff, like in terms of time input. Yeah, so so like one thing that comes up a lot is like um, seed crops on the face of it. You can make a lot more money from selling a seed crop than you can a vegetable as a crop. But yeah. then obviously the seeds take a lot more time and they take more like time in your rotation and they take more of your labor time and your skills. Precisely. And I actually wanted to ask Anne as well about that, which is, um, Anne, you were saying like, it's obviously more profitable to grow a seed crop than sell something as a crop, but then as a vegetable crop, but um, it's in your ground for longer. Like potentially you can't put other crops in your rotation because it's there. It takes more of your time. It takes more of your skill. What do you think about, is that worth it? Like, is it, is it worth all that extra time and space for the extra money? Um, well, it, well, for me it is. It's, it's also a matter of which crops you grow. Uh, so I did try uh, a kale as you know, um, and that takes up a heck of a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And because we allo allocated it space in the polytunnel, uh, and in, you know, polytunnel space is very precious and it, it, can earn, it can earn you good money. And a kale seed crop, even at the best of time, won't earn you so much money. I, I don't think I will do kale seed commercially again. Uh, because it takes so much space and because it takes a lot of looking after and there's a lot that can go around, wrong with it. Um, we had aphids, you get woolly aphids, you get caterpillars, you get slugs, you get uh, this kind of bacterial disease that can come and set in. There is uh, cabbage root fly, oh my God, name it. You know, it's quite a troublesome crop if you want it in the ground for that long. Also our ground, isn't that brilliant? We do have, uh, club root in the ground so for brassicas it's not ideal but the other crops tomatoes and cucumbers is is amazing and it's actually easier it's less work because you i you know i like i love growing veg but i hate picking so it's one thing you you only do about a couple of times for those seed crops you only pick them twice really the first lot you let them ripen and then you you go over them and you pick them and then you you'll do that again you know a, a month or six weeks later you do it again and so it's less work in that sense because you're doing it all in one go it's not the twice a week you know the picking that you would do normally if you were selling the the fruit for eating so i i don't i don't think it's necessarily more work it really does depend on what crop you're growing and even the brassicas you know when they're flowering they're they they're a real benefit to an organic garden because the more brassica flowers you can have in your garden the more predatory uh insects you you attract and so they'll mop up a lot of the pests like aphids mm -hmm. so you know it's um I still think, you know, there's a lot of benefits. And I mean, I will still continue because I've got my own kale going and I, I want to keep on growing the seed for that. But if you're not doing it commercially, then you don't need to have like 40 odd plants, you know, you have a few plants and maybe occasionally chuck another one, another one in that um, from another seed base because you're not so concerned about purity of seed or the purity of a strain. You know, you just want to keep a nice, healthy, resilient kale going. So, yeah, so Jeff, I can see your hand, but I'm just going to address something in the chat, which is um, a question which is about other crops nearby and like about the covered space that you need. Um, so basically in the next session next month is 25th of February and you will all be sent the Zoom link for that. Um, we are covering botany and plant reproduction. And that is when we will talk in depth about isolation. So all this thing that we're talking about now about plants crossing with each other, we'll discuss how that works and how, what different crops need 
uh, to stop them from crossing with other things and like what covered space you need. So we won't answer that now because um, I'm worried that we're going to get into nitty gritty crop discussions now. And that's for many more future sessions. Um, we have 10 minutes left. I know this has been quite a long session, two hours. Um, it's just because we've got a lot to cover and I have like a couple of final slides that I wanted to share with you. Um, is there like uh, any single questions and um, that haven't been addressed? I don't think there is. I've looked on the chat. Okay, I'm just going to for the last few minutes. Thank you very much, Anne. That was really interesting. It was really good to get your perspective. Thanks so much, Sue, as well. Like, yeah really amazing history of seed in the UK. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen and last slides. Um, they worked last time, actually. Well, I'll just try it again. Um, in fact, Sarah, do you still have it? Well, yeah, know. sure. Yeah, yeah sure. You do that? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to end by like going over. Yeah, that's that's the first slide that I wanted to show. Um, like seed sovereignty opportunities, which Anne has ready like um just to emphasize this thing on um far, like on farm use of seed so like Anne said if you're producing your own seed on your farm it's higher quality and it's better adapted to your conditions and I also just want to flag up this massive thing about um improved access to varieties because um demand for ecologically grown seed was up by 600 percent last year so there's going to be um, potentially seed shortages. I don't want to cause people to like panic or anything, but long term, like demand for UK grown ecological seed has massively increased. And so if you want to make sure that you have access to the varieties that you want to grow, that's one of the reasons why seed saving is so important. Um, next slide. Um, I'm just basically outlining some of the reasons really why to produce seed, which I know Anne has touched on. But another thing, um, seed circles, and we did mention this before that we run a Wales seed hub where different commercial growers um, who've been through our training are, are trying to share seed across Wales. And the idea of a seed circle is basically that each grower takes on a variety or a couple of varieties, and then you all meet once a year and you share those varieties. So it's a way of accessing like multiple varieties, but only growing a couple yourself. And you can do that with other professional growers if you want to keep it professional or it can be a community thing. Um, and it can also be regionally specific. So you could have a seed circle that's like Pembrokeshire specific, specific so that you can share seed that's regionally adapted to that area. But it's just a good way of like um, of sharing seeds and keeping, yeah, keeping seed diversity um, by just growing a couple and sharing them. Another example is uh, Lampeter Seed Library, which is a community initiative, but they basically give out seed each year and then their members grow that, that seed and then they return some seed back to the library each year for more people to grow. So it's just that idea of keeping the seed in, in circulation. Um, next slide, Sarah. Oh, that's just a picture of our Wales Seed Hub. So like I said, um, when you've got to the end of this training, if you'd like to join the Wales Seed Hub, um, we're working together to share varieties and we're actually working together to try to sell some of those varieties direct. Um, next slide. And another thing that has been mentioned a lot and just to flag that up again is contract <laughs> selling. So um, that's real seeds in the picture on the left who we work with. And there are real seeds and other ecological seed businesses in the UK who do really want to contract people. And like Jeff and Anne were saying, they've been um, growing seed, selling it to those seed companies and they'll provide you with the starter seed. And you're obviously going to sell it for wholesale price because they'll do a lot of the packing and the cleaning and they take on the legal responsibility for selling that seed. Um, but that can be a really good thing. And like Anne and Jeff outlined, you know, it's quite a profitable thing and it can complement your business. So at the end of this course, we can talk more about, you know, if you feel ready to move on to being contracted and you will have to have some experience of seed production to be contracted. But that's something that you can move towards. And then the last slide, the next one. Oh, it's not the last one. That's an example of prices. And we won't go over that because we've come to the end of the session, but I'll email that out to you guys as like an example of what um, a seed company might pay for seed. Um, so the next one should be the last one. And that's just to flag up that, like if you wanna, you know, obviously you're gonna be learning seed production this year. Um, 
And if your ultimate aim is to move towards selling seed direct yourself, like I said, there is a huge demand for that. Like demand for ecologically grown seed was up by 600% last year. Um, so there's like, if you want to progress as a business to be able to sell seed direct, there's definitely a market for that. And something that our seed sovereignty program can help you with in the future is the legalities. There are legalities and legislation around seed selling, but they're not impossible to navigate. Like um, our Wales Seed Hub is working on um, selling seed direct and it's not that hard to register as a seed marketer and even to register for plant passports. It's totally possible. And then you can be legally selling seed. Um, Obviously, you've got to think about like packaging, storaging, distribution and how profitable it is. We can cover all of that in later sessions. But I just basically wanted to say like there's loads of opportunity for selling seed if that's what you want to progress to. Um, so, yeah, that's the end. That's my last slide. So we can stop sharing that. Um, we've come to the end. I know we've talked a lot. <laughs> Hopefully some of it's been interesting and inspiring. Um, if you have more questions, pressing questions, email them to me. Um, otherwise, what we'll do is I'll send out the info in advance of the next session with some resources. And like I said, the next session is going to be botanically focused. And we're going to have um, Katrina from the Heritage Seed Library going to take us through plant reproduction and uh, pollination. So, yeah, that's the start of our um, practical, practical learning. Um, and I'll also send you out that survey to see if you guys want a WhatsApp group or a Facebook group to share info between you. Um, it's been really great to meet you all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Sarah, do you have any closing things that you wanted to say? Sarah, either of the Sarahs from Tubby Cymru? Yes, sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. And, and Sue and Dan, thank you very much. That was a really informative session and great to have the comments in the chat. Inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's lovely. Really great to hear. If you can fill in our survey just to give us some feedback on how you felt the session went, we'd be really grateful. But we're very pleased to be supporting Katie and the Gaia Foundation with this um, with this work. If you are new to Tubby Cymru, I can see lots of familiar um, faces and names, but if you're new to Tubby Cymru and you want extra support, uh, we're here to support Welsh growers. And if you want to engage, then come onto the website, find us or email us. We support all sizes and types of growers and it's 100% funded support. Um, there's We work through a lot of networks, so you're now a part of the seed network, but that doesn't preclude you from being a part of any other networks. And you can access um, specialist support in technical horticulture or other things like digital marketing and social media. So. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot out there. I'll just very, very quickly, not to keep you any longer, but um, just share the website with the sort of thing. Can you see that? Is that visible, Katie? Yeah, it's just sharing yeah. now. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Just to show you the sort of things. Tomorrow night, Lucy Taylor's doing a webinar on assisting growers to navigate the planning process. What we're doing with all our meetings, they're all um, meetings where you can all come on like you are tonight rather than it being a faceless webinar. So, um, which um, is a nicer feeling we think than uh, only being able to see the speaker and not everybody else that's on there. Uh, but I thought that was an absolutely fantastic session. Really great, thank you, Katie. That two hours has flown by for me. So super, great to see you all. Hope to see you all again. Thanks, see you all next month. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Katie. And thanks, Sue, thanks, Anne. Thanks. No. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.